Good morning. Welcome to St. Luke Lutheran Church. This is class number eight in our series on Messianic Expectations. And today we're going to be talking about the Messiah as creator. And this one, uh, the expectations are lower than the other um, uh, types. I um, had a midweek panic because I wasn't finding as much material on this one as I thought I would. Plenty in the, in the New Testament. Uh, but not so much in the old. Uh, so uh, maybe we have to admit up front that the Old Testament believers were not thinking about the Messiah in terms of the creator so much. But we will see there are some things and uh, we'll tie it all together. So I'm sure we'll have a fruitful discussion. And if you want to just completely go off topic, go on, launch into some tangent today. Uh, you, you have more than the usual amount of permission uh, to, to, uh, to grab hold of the agenda and make it your own. <laughs> so, um, so let's uh, begin with prayer. God, uh, uh, bless our study today and teach us from your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's have somebody look up that Psalm 102 passage. And there's a Isaiah 51 passage and an Isaiah 11. So who wants to do Psalm 102, 25 to 27? Carl has that one. Isaiah 51, 14 to 16. Down. Isaiah 11, 1 through 9. That's a longer one. Oh, yeah, Tom. Good. All right, we'll, we'll front load it with those three and then uh, look at uh, more uh, later. Psalm 102, let's hear that one. 25 through 27. Long ago, you laid the foundations of the earth, even the heavens, and the works of the hands. They will come to an end, but you will still go on. They will all wear out like clothing. You will change them like clothes, and they will be thrown away. But you remain the same, and your life will never end. Okay, now this is an interesting one because on the surface, we wouldn't necessarily recognize this as a uh, messianic prophecy, but it is quoted in Hebrews 1 um, a, as part of the um, Old Testament witness to Christ and the type of uh, person the Messiah would be. So here we see, um, it's uh, what is wearing out like a garment? Um, what are they talking about in that passage? I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah, so the heavens and the earth, right? The, all of creation. But in the beginning, how does how does it express it in that passage? In the beginning, you did what? Laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hand. But they will perish. All right. So this creation is passing away. It will wear out. And that's um. Um, was that part of God's original plan? Uh, I'm not, probably not. Uh, yeah, um, and in fact, it's wearing out and the creation is groaning, it says in scripture, all because of the fall, man's sin. Man's um, responsibility as the steward of creation. And uh, so there, there is a, brokenness to all creation because of man's sin. But it's going to be replaced, right? So there's going to be a new heaven and new earth. And so um, I think what we're going to see in some of these passages is the Messiah's role is particularly uh, as creator is in the, in the role of recreator or restoring of creation, right? So uh, the, 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 new, the, the old creation is going to wear out like a garment and they will be discarded. And then, um, but God 
remains the same. All right. God is God is eternal. All right, let's hear that 50, Isaiah 51 passage, verses 14 through 16. And no one in prison is going to be set free, and they will not die in their dungeon, and they will not get back to rest. And I am the Lord God, who turns up the seas, that is, we need to walk. The Lord of the Lord is the Lord. Take my words in your mouth, and tell you the shout of my hand. I will set the heavens in place, and the foundations of the earth, who say to Zion, You are my people. All right, now this is an interesting one because, um, and what translation is that, Don, if I may ask? NIV. And in fact, a lot of translations follow, uh, do what the NIV here is. So at one point, um, he says, um, what's that, and in the start of verse 16, um, exactly how does it put that? Don, if you could repeat that. I am the Lord your God. He turns up the seas, and that is from the Lord. In 16, what 16, is it? Yeah. 16, I put my words in my mouth. Okay, let's stop right there. Now, that's an important passage in the, in this. I put my words in your mouth. So um, maybe we're not clear on who the you is. Who is God addressing there? Anyone care to guess? And maybe you just don't have enough information. But um, there is an indication that he's speaking to the Messiah there. And what's interesting is, uh, and then and then, what does it say right after that, Don, in that translation and in many translations? Yeah, I, I who set the heavens in place and, and then... What's the next, right? And then what's the next verb? And, and to speak to Zion. So um, there's two verbs there. It's all about establishing, um, well, I'm not sure how your translation puts it, but it's all about creating and then speaking. But the interesting thing is in the, in the Hebrew, those are infinitives. It doesn't actually say I created and I would speak. It says, to create and to speak. So if you take, um, I don't, I, I honestly didn't find out why it's typically translated so that it's God referring to his own action. Because literally it's saying, he's, he's saying, I will commission you, right? What's that, um, what's the, uh, the wording in your translation in the beginning of 16 again? Word in your mouth. No, no, wait. Yeah, I, right. I have put my words in your mouth, and then it says, to create and to say to Zion. All right. So if you take it very literally, the one whom God is commissioning is the one who creates and the one who speaks to Zion. So there's a strong indication, and some people will list this as a messianic prophecy as well. I believe that's there's, Jim. I think there's support for that. He asked the question. Speaking to it, I went back to the And then he says, perfect for me in the evening, and there's a path. But then he's got to look, just not going to be safe. Away, away, for that strength, oh, I am for Awake is in the ancient days, in the generation of old. It began And the rest of this passage includes what you just had a picture To me, what you said is backed up by what the media sees. Yeah, there seems to be some shifting of, of, uh, who is speaking and who is being addressed? Well, the Lord. Or the arm of the Lord. And could the arm of the Lord be referring to 
uh, the second person of the Trinity, who is the one who acts. And it also says, well, therefore, the redeemed is the Lord What you said makes sense. Okay, good. Because it appears on lists, and, and you know, and you have to kind of uh, dig a little deeper to find out why. Lists of messianic prophecies. Okay. Um, so, and then, and then it's the question. Some people make a big deal about. Um, that creation, is it the original creation or is it the new heaven and earth? Okay. But I think we're going to make a, build a case here, particularly when we look at the New Testament passages, that the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is involved in the original creation as well as the new creation. So uh, to me, it's not critical that we nail down uh, which one they're talking about, because I think uh, the Messiah is involved in both. Okay, let's see that as Isaiah 11 passage, 1 through 9. This is a long one. Yeah, great. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy or fall my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the, of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All right, this is a very familiar messianic prophecy. And in the first half, just listing off a whole bunch of roles that the Messiah will fill. If you've got your um, Bible open to that passage in Isaiah 11, first nine verses, let's work through the verses and just list off uh, the various um, descriptions of the Messiah. So in the first verse. Seven spirits of God that come down from God. That is really fascinating. So tell us more about the seven spirits. Oh, okay. Just a description of Jesus. These are Holy Spirit inspired and motivated spirits. So there's seven things in this list that we should be looking for then, apparently. Yeah. All right. Well, that's really interesting. Has anyone else has heard that? Uh, well, let's find them, okay? In that first verse. The stump of Jesse, what's that about? Jesse was best known as who? The father of David. David. And why is David important in talking about the Messiah. Well, Messiah's going to sit on the throne of David. Sit on the throne of David. Right. And why does he get to sit on that throne? Because it's a family line. It's a family line. So he's the, he's the, the, the son of David. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted you to say those words, son of David. But yes, he will sit on David's throne because God promised David that um, 
uh, the Messiah would come from his line. Um, his roots, yes. So, okay, and then um, the next sentence, what is it about the Messiah that's described there in the next sentence? Yes, he'll be full of the Spirit. And it's specifically, that's a spirit of... Yes, or you might say wisdom, depending on the translation, and of understanding, of power. Hmm. Spirit, of, oh yeah, spirit of counsel and might, yes. So there's lots of things that the spirit is doing. And then the spirit of the, what does it say next? Knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Knowledge and fear of the Lord, good. And he will delight in what? The fear of the Lord. That's an interesting uh, aspect. But what does it mean? Oh, we talk, we're talking about fear in um, the sermon series that we're in right now and the fear of the Lord. Uh, Pastor said this morning that the fear of the Lord is the good kind of fear. But wh what does it mean to delight in the Lord? I'm not uh, in the fear of the Lord. That is some, um, I think if we don't understand the fear of the Lord properly, that a phrase might not make a lot of sense. Sure, Marie, you first. Uh, fear of the Lord, if it's strong within you, it will help to curb your behaviors. Right. Because you'll want to please God. Right. You don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Good. Uh, fear of the Lord is reverence and respect for him. Right. Yeah, sure, Jim. King James. And what happened when he stepped up in the temple and had this passage? Hmm. It's amazing, I should say. Well, it's all of the same thing. It's not the same. When Jesus goes there, Right. So, um, who can tie this together then? How does the growing in the fear of the Lord uh, lead you to delight in the fear of the Lord? That's what I want to put together here. Okay, well, there's the, um, there's the uh, joy and satisfaction just from clean living. Yeah. But I have a feeling there might be even more. There's something about, sure, oh, Bill. You think of, you know, watch your way so personally that we really respect that you would delight to be in your presence. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, even if it might be like a revered teacher or a mentor, someone that you are not on equal terms with, someone who you, you would never feel like that kind of familiarity with, right? Don, did you have something? Well, it, it seems like that's just it's like the same thing, you know, mm. okay, he's the one to be feared, he's the one to be respected. I'm going to be on his side. Right. It's sort of like the day of the Lord and all the descriptions of the terror and the destruction and the overthrowing of so many things, so many people, human institutions. And then often the psalmist or the Old Testament writer will be talking about it like, yes, the day of the Lord when everything's going to be smashed. And it's like, wow. So what it means is if you've got the relation, if you are in right relationship with the one who wields all this power. Which the transcends our normal understanding of what it means to be afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we could keep, yeah, sure, Bill. Remind me of the song that was said again last Sunday. The Lord of Eagle Army, he is a friend. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or if you think, yeah, or if you think of the role that the son has in, you know, the king's household and um, completely different way that the son thinks of the king versus the subjects or the servants, right? Did I see a hand again? Okay, great, good. So um, moving on then, he will not judge by what? He will not judge by, what does it say there in, I've lost track of the verses. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears justice and he will get a decision okay so he's not judging then when it says by what he sees or what he hears what what is that what is that expressing what kind of judgment would that be if you're going by what you see or by what you hear i'm sorry worldly. a worldly judgment yeah i'm thinking of a big pardon yeah. Yeah, so the out the outward appearance versus what's really going on inside. But he will judge, um, but with righteousness he will judge. The needy, he will, with justice, he will give decisions for the poor. So if you are um, going to court and you are the wounded party or the aggrieved party, then the justice that is spoken by the just judge is you are absolutely, yeah, let's have that judgment. It, it all depends, you know, are you a sheep or are you a goat, you know? Uh, which, which direction do you split off, right? Um, wh what your relationship to the judge and to the judgment is. All right, and then, uh, so we're we're talking about the Messiah and all of the things that he's going to accomplish. And then we pivot to the wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat. And that passage now is talking about a future. What, what does this mean? These animals um, hanging out together in peace, love, and harmony. Okay. What is that? What is that ta telling us? All right. All right. So peace, even even among the animal kingdom. So what does that indicate? This peace that uh, the the Messiah will bring is going to apply even to what animals, and more broadly, then they represent what. Living beings. All living beings. I would say the whole created order is going to be transformed. All right. And so, um, you know, the, the lion will now um, go vegan, right? <laughs> okay. And um, you, I don't think lions can really, I, I, you know, people. People talk about, you know, whether um, they want to feed their dogs, uh, you know, a, a vegetarian diet or not. And then usually someone will say, oh, and let's let's put cats on vegetarian diets. And people, that's where people will stop and say, yeah, dogs are kind of omnivores. Maybe you can make that work. But a cat, I think they're just, they're, their entire that they're, the design as it is now in our fallen world is is carnivore, right? So anyway, I, maybe I'm getting into a little more uh, controversy <laughs> than I intended to, but the point is um, th there will be a kind of complete reordering of creation. And it's all that the kingdom of God breaking in, that's uh, what Jesus preached, the kingdom of God, meaning God's order and God's design, original perfect design for the world will be brought in. Well, you can't, you can't make that happen 
the way things are structured now. So there's a complete recreation. And that's where the Messiah as creator comes in. He will be accomplishing this transformation. Okay, now let's jump ahead. So Micah 5.2. We have talked about the word of God. And uh, um, um, in the previous series, Jesus in the Old Testament, we spent a lot of time talking about this term word of God uh, applied to Jesus Christ, applied to the Messiah. Uh, let's look at Micah 5.2. I'll read it out here. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephratha, <laughs> Ephratha, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Okay, so this is an important passage to us today in this uh, in this talk today because. Um, this is a passage that indicates that the Messiah will actually come from ancient of days. He predates creation. In fact, um, that's a phrase that's normally used of God. So it's a hinting that the Messiah is actually God. All right. And we talked about. Um, so that raises the question. If the Messiah was present at creation, did he have a hand in it? All right. The New Testament will answer that question. Um, we look at Genesis 1. Uh, we've, uh, that has come up a lot in these two series. Um, that's God is creating the world by what means? Word. Spoken word. So the word of God is absolutely central to creation. And then when the word of God gets applied to Jesus Christ, um, those passages uh, of the Bible are tied together. I mentioned the Targums. Who remembers what the Targums are from the uh, Jewish, commentary? Jewish commentaries? Right. On the Bible. Do you remember what language they're written in? Aramaic. Aramaic, yeah. So... Um, during Second Temple Judaism, this is um, after the return from the exile in Babylon. So these are a few centuries just before the birth of Christ. And um, a lot of important um, um, theology gets laid down. But what's happening in terms of the language that the people are speaking is Hebrew is now... Uh, fading from everyday use, and it's becoming a dead language. So they have the ancient scriptures in Hebrew, all right? And then they get together, 70 scholars get together because uh, the most common language after Alexander the Great came in and conquered everything uh, in the Middle East area, what language became dominant? Greek. Greek and Greek culture also. So this is Greek culture became dominant. So this is the Hellenistic era, right? Greek culture. So thank you. And what does what does that sept in Septuagint mean? Septuagint. Sept. Seven. Seven. So it's referring to the 70 scholars who translated the Bible into Greek. And that translation was so important and so influential, um, and, and even Bible translators to this day will, will uh, on some of the difficult passages in the Old Testament, they'll say, okay, well, let's see what the, the, the translators of the Septuagint, how did they interpret these, these phrases or words that we're not sure about the meaning. And um, in the synagogues, in this period, the Second Temple Judaism period, it period, you could um, read the Hebrew um, for liturgical purposes, and that was okay. But the people couldn't understand that, right? So one 
one alternative that was allowed was to read from the Septuagint, okay? And you could read the Septuagint and it was so respected as a translation that that was allowed as a substitute for the original. Can you, can you tell us what time period you're referring to? Okay, so the Babylonian exile, this is the last centuries BC, basically. I don't remember that what date you can put on the end of the Babylonian captivity. Would that be 300 something BC? Carl, can you help us out to remember? So it's after the last prophet, but before Jesus comes? Um, that is a good point. Yeah, there weren't, there, there, there's a period of silence there, mm -hmm. right? Something like three or four hundred years before Jesus came. All right, and so, but the um, but if you're um, reading the Septuagint, a lot of in in various places, the language that was spoken by the common people was Aramaic. So they came up with these the targums, which were not a translation; their commentary. Okay. And they really kind of go off the reservation a little bit, you know. So it, it, it is really commentary. They're embellishing and adding. And so the Targums could not be read liturgically on their own. So typically the practice, if you weren't reading from the Septuagint, what you would do is read the Hebrew and everyone would sit there. And it's a little bit like, you know, if you were in a, a Latin mass in the in the. Uh, you know, Catholic Church or something. You just maybe the words. Some some of the, the the more educated people would get it, and then and then they would read the Targums as a commentary on that. So it didn't quite have the same place. But what's interesting is one of the things that they did in the Targums is they you know that they um, developed this a uh, practice of never speaking the word Yahweh or Y H W H. Elohim, they would replace it with Elohim, but in the Targums, they would go farther and they would start any place in the Old Testament that God was acting in the world, they would replace that with the phrase, the word of God. Okay, so that's really interesting. So they started thinking of God, Yahweh, um, the, the transcendent, um, God, who is all powerful, who is too far above us, we cannot see, we cannot approach, no man can see him and live. And then you've got in the Targums this idea that, uh, but there, ooh, there are these places in the Old Testament where people did see God, or God did come down and speak to them, or the angel of the Lord came to them and spoke. Well, how do we deal with that? Well, we're, we're going to call that the word of God, all right? And then I told you about um, this really interesting uh, philosopher, Philo of Alexandria. How many people remember when we covered him? That was um, a number of months ago, but he lived, um, he was born BC and died AD. So his lifetime overlaps with Jesus Christ. But he was down in Alexandria, he was trained as a Greek philosopher, but he was also a, uh, an observant Jew. And he came up with this idea that the, the word of God, okay, so um, we talked about the two powers of heaven and how do you deal with God being transcendent, but also the angel of the Lord speaking as though he's God, and he appears as a man. How do you deal with this? These two powers are the two thrones, which we've talked about over and over. The two thrones in the vision of Daniel and Daniel 7. Why are there two thrones? If God is sitting on one and then this, this human figure apparently gets the other throne. So how do you reconcile all that? And Philo's solution is so fascinating. He used the word, get your bingo cards ready. What's the word, Carl, remember? No, the hypo... Hypostasis, the Greek word, which means a, um, and of course you have to be very carefully, I, I, I'm careful theologically. Uh, in the pagan world, it was like an instantiation of a god. And um, 
Philo said, well, we can use this concept, this, this um, maybe, maybe Yahweh has more than one hypostasis. And I've got to tell you, I found out that actually most people pronounce that word hypostasis. So I'm going to have to start saying hypostasis just to confuse you more. I, yeah, well, it's it's Greek, but um, as spoken in English, I I heard someone say hypostasis. I've checked some dic two different dictionaries, and that's the preferred pronunciation. So I've been steering you wrong all these months. Okay, so he came up with the, actually he he basically concluded that God had three hypostases hypostases, the Father, the Word of God, and then the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, I've forgotten exactly how he described the Holy Spirit, but he got really close. He said, God the Father creates the Word and the Spirit. Yeah. But, yeah, and the alarm goes off in Carl's head, right? But that's the way Philo, you know, working with his limited understanding, said, the Father creates the, the Word of God and the Spirit as hypostases from his essence. So that's an interesting, pretty close. But, of course, we reject the terminology of create. God does not create. The Father does not create the Son. The Father begets the Son, right? And then the Spirit proceeds. But all are eternal. And they're, and they're fixed. There's only three hypostases of Yahweh. Each hypostasis, hypostasis is eternal. They are co-eternal. Three persons, one God. All right. All right. Let's, so that, um, then, of course, in John 1, we have, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that that strange duality that the fa the son is God, but the son is not the father, right? Um, the, the, the word was with God and the word was God. And, he's, and John is using all these streams. We're um, using the word of God um, as a way of speaking about God. And he says, uh, this, this Jesus Christ, this Jesus of Nazareth who appeared, he is the fulfillment of all this, of all this um, uh, word of God. All right, let's now let's um, pull out some First Corinthians eight six, uh, some passages from the old uh, from the New Testament. Uh, somebody look at First uh, Corinthians eight six. Let's have someone look at Colossians one sixteen. Those are short passages and then the, the 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 number one passage for this study Hebrews 1 all right uh, who's who can have Hebrews 1 1 through 9 that long passage ready Bill's got that one all right somebody read first Corinthians 8 6 for us yeah for us there is but one God all right so um these new past new testament writers are asserting that uh not only is jesus christ god but he was it um he was active in creation so it is only Jesus Christ, we exist only through Jesus Christ. We are, all things are by him, right? Uh, Colossians 1, 16, who can read that, please? For in him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, all right, and uh, Ron, can you confirm, since I chopped that out of context, uh, confirm who is being uh, described, who is the him in that verse? Um, 
there you go. Yeah, the image of the invisible God. So the Son is the first, the person of the, of the Trinity that we can see, right? All right, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. What is what is being described there? Probably. <laughs> Did you say po politics? Government? Yeah, I think it's even, I think it's, ref that's possible. I'm going to, I grant you that. I think it's referring to something else, though. Because the, when, you, when you say governments, you're referring to earthly rulers. I think so. I think it's at least included in this list are ranks and orders of angels. Okay, sometimes in the Old Testament they would be referred to the or translated as the sons of God, but they're the the powers and the the heavenly order under Yahweh God. Um, all of these angels and spiritual authorities that have been granted their authority from God. All right, so that's pretty cool. Jesus Christ, the Son of God is at the top absolutely at the top he's the, the the messiah is not just a super powerful created being right he uh he is with the father from eternity past all right let's hear that hebrews 1 1 through 9. bill i think you volunteered to read that in the past god spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, to be appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I will be Or again, to be his father, and he will be my son. And again, when God brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship. And speaking of the angels, he said, He makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he said, Your throne, O God, will last. Love righteousness. Therefore, God, I love you today. I anointed you with the oil. Right, so um, I'm looking for the verse that specifically says that the sun um, created the world. Oh, it flew right by and then I lost it. Does anyone see where it is? Oh, yeah, it's in verse 2. It's in verse 2. Yeah, read that for us, please. He has spoken to us by his son, who will be appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. Made the universe. Okay. So that's um, checking the boxes here. Why is the son not just another angel and just another spirit, created spirit? And number one, there, um, he, um, through whom, yeah, he has the power to create. All right. There are a whole bunch of other things, though. Let's um, pick some of these out here. How is the sun superior to the angels? What are some of the other things well, in this list? That's right. They worship him. Absolutely. Only God can receive worship. We've seen places in the Old Testament where uh, a, an archangel appears um, and they're so startling and frightening that 
uh, someone will begin to worship them and that person will be rebuked. No, don't worship me. You only worship God. Yeah, go ahead. Did you have? I guess not. Okay. What else? The sun? Yeah, no. Right. So that's sustaining the world. So keeping it running. This idea that if if uh, the sun stopped thinking about the world for one second, it would just cease to exist, right? And um, and he's the exact representation of the fa- the the being of the Father. All right, that's in that verse too. Yeah, sure, Carl. Yeah, that is something you would only say about God, that we, in him, we live and have our being. Anything else here? I think there are a few more. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Okay, so that. Uh, that relationship, it's not creation, as we were talking about. Philo of Alexandria, smart guy, really impressive what he put together there in the Old Testament. But he was wrong. The father does not create the son. The father begets the son. Right? What else? Is there anything else in this passage? What else begat me? Um, well, Carl... Um, <laughs> I think maybe you need to, um, <laughs> you're embarrassing me Carl. Uh, I uh, I think everyone needs to go talk to their parents <laughs> um, this is the um, it's it's generation by reproduction right so the son is the exact representation of the father that's right it's not the father doesn't fashion the son the way you, you know, work with clay, right? I think this is, to me, one of those passages where we realize as human, well, at least I realize as a human being, everything I read in the scripture, I hope I have the Holy Spirit to um, teach me, but I am limited by, you know, those limits that God has put in my cognitive abilities to comprehend things based on language that we believe or that, that, that relates to us. So I'm not even sure this is making any sense, but we, we want to understand things in the Bible based on what we experience, what we've been taught, and what is real to us. So this whole concept of Jesus being the son of God, but he was there from the beginning. God created everything. You know, it's like, I can follow all of that until that point of, well, now, wait a minute. I know I came from two parents. I know the biology. I know all this stuff. (laughs) So I can't make that work with this language. So I I have to just give up and say, "This, this, uh, this is me speaking. I just have to give up and say, this is a mystery that maybe someday in heaven I'll understand, but even then, it probably won't matter. Mm. But it it does, it draws me to want to know more, and then I get get to that wall where I say, I will never comprehend. Because of the relationship we have with the Father, we... We, we can, as we grow in maturity, we can surrender the need to understand everything, seems to me. That's a good phrase. There's a Michael Card song, and it struck me. I'd heard this dozens of times, and he uses that phrase. Surrender the hunger to... There's something about surrender the hunger to know, the courage to say, I believe. Mm. You know, it's that... that just what you're saying here, surrendering the, the idea that I have to comprehend this. Yeah. Without my comprehension, it can't be true. 
you know, I got to give up on that. Yeah. Try. God said it. I believe that <laughs> that settles it. Yeah, there you go. Mm-hmm. Some people say that's one too many steps, Carl. <laughs> okay, then we have a few points. Because if we believe that God, the, the triune God, our Creator, transcends time and space and even the nature that He created for here, then you, I don't get it, but as you're talking about it, the Christ was begotten, but He was at the beginning of time. So that He was made man of God. Only two thousand ten years ago, you, you think that's too hard, but it doesn't seem hard at all if you believe everything he says about himself, both God the Father and God the Son. And, and so, and I, I suppose that that's one of those cases where the rest of God is. Yeah, well, they, they ran that experiment yeah. already. <laughs> it didn't work out right. All right, let's let's uh, jump to the Revelation. Revelation 21. Uh, this is a great one, a very long one. I'll read it. Revelation 21, 1 through 14. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write down, write this down, for these are the words that are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels, who had seven bowls full of seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away to the spirit, in the spirit, to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like Jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall of 12 gates with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so where does this new Jerusalem come from? That is in verse 2. comes down out of heaven from God. All right. What are the characteristics of, that's not New Jersey. I don't know why. I, <laughs> I, that's the New Jerusalem. NJ in this context is New Jerusalem. What are the characteristics? Yes, it's certainly not New, New Jersey that's being described there. In verse 3, um, what are the characteristics? Verse 3? Why did I say verse 3? Oh, well, because that's where it starts. Um, he'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll yeah. be no more doubt from morning. <laughs> the old order of things. Right. Right, and there will be an end of sorrow and pain and suffering. How does the angel describe the city? And in particular, that was um, 
Yeah, in verse 9, he says, come, I will show you what? He's talking about the city, but he says, I will show you the bride. So, or more specifically, those who are living. It's the bride of Christ that this city has been prepared for. Um, and we're, we're running out of time here, so uh, jumping ahead then. The angel proceeds to measure the city, which is a clear echo of a prophecy from Ezekiel. All right. The last, what, few chapters, two or three chapters of Ezekiel is all about very detailed descriptions of uh, the New Jerusalem. And that um, the tree of life that's there, that's an obvious echo back to Eden. All right, okay, so the the first creation when it was in its unfallen, pure, perfect state, and um, and that tree of life is for the healing of the nations. So we talked about the Messiah as healer, and there's an enormous amount of overlap when we start talking about the Messiah as recreator and establishing the new creation, the healing. The, the, the um, healing will be a part of that, um, the, the works of healing that Jesus did while he was here on earth are the sign, the indication of the coming kingdom of God and how all of creation will be reordered. All right. Um, yes, I think we should wrap it up there. Okay, so may God bless your week go with you and uh, may we um, go as ambassadors of God's kingdom and the new creation. Amen. Yeah.